Hi. I'd like to take a little bit of time today to talk to you about the end of the world as you know it. Our infrastructure defines us as civilized people, as you know, modern nations. We live and die by it, and we rarely even know it's there. We live in kind of this very thin little layer of sociality on top of huge and poorly understood accretions of infrastructure. By definition, we really only notice it when it fails. You know, uh, one morning you're sitting there having a perfectly reasonable cup of coffee, and you read in the newspaper that the economy has collapsed and the money that you bought your coffee with is now worthless. Except, of course, the paper went bankrupt last week, and uh, an oil shortage has stopped coffee shipping in from the plantation, and the power's out anyway, so there's no uh, energy to heat the water with. Um, things can go from relatively normal to very grim in much less time than you'd expect. So, why does our infrastructure keep breaking? You know, we hear on the news that you know, we see these large-scale systems, like the banking system, suddenly explodes when everyone thought things were going great. Boom, and no more banking system. You know, or no more banking system is the way we thought it worked. Um, why do systems that used to be reliable and that we thought were well understood suddenly seem foreign and inherently unreliable? When you take a look under the covers, our infrastructure is really actually in pretty terrible shape. We're falling further and further behind in maintaining what we have, and we're increasingly unable to catch up with the kind of basic maintenance that we should have been doing decades ago. Moreover, as a society, we haven't actually realized how bad the situation is yet. There are a lot of factors that can be seen as contributing to this, and they all operate at pretty fundamental levels. Capitalism works on the basis of the extraction and accumulation of value. Corporations have an impetus, and indeed, in most cases, an onus to extract, extract as much surplus value as possible from the world around them. If a maintenance budget can be cut, it will be, until a system fails and, inf and forces that corporation to spend money on that maintenance budget again. Governments are subject to the same logic. The same forces of accumulation and ever-improving efficiency affect the government world just as much as the corporate world. This leads to a situation where we have systematically underinvested in all of our existing infrastructure wherever and whenever possible. In the United States, this is to the tune of something like $5 trillion or more just to maintain basic things like sewer systems and the power grid and the highways and the water system. Money is much more likely to go into building new infrastructure, which brings, in theory, new revenue streams. So we can picture our collective infrastructure as suffering from a cumulative economic deficit. In the long run, of course, this is ridiculous. The cost of infrastructural failures greatly outweighs any gains that you get from shaving maintenance budgets. Furthermore, you can predict a maintenance budget. You can say, oh, well, we think that this you know, part is going to have to get replaced every 10 years, so we'll just replace it every 10 years. If then that part fails unexpectedly because you haven't replaced it in 20, who knows how much that failure is going to cost you. Um, maintenance budgets are predictable. Catastrophic failure costs aren't. Infrastructure tends to have, you know, when it's physical hardware infrastructure, tends to have predictable lifespans. Understanding this requires a long-term perspective. A lot of the infrastructure that's currently aging out was built after the Second World War. And that, that infrastructure now needs to be replaced we're just not doing it. Um, businesses think in terms of quarters. At best, businesses might think in terms of years or a couple of years. Politicians think in terms of election cycles, maybe five or 10 years if you're lucky. Civil servants, once they had the experience to understand that they need to be doing long-term thinking, if you're lucky, they think to the end of their career. That might be 20 or 30 years. We need to be we need people who are thinking on the scale of centuries, on the scale of half centuries, because that's the scale that infrastructure fails on. So we have a time mismatch between the way we think about our large systems, and that time mismatch is what drives this misunderstanding of failure. You know, in any given five-year period, you're probably fine. Over a 50-year period, you're almost certainly going to have a catastrophic failure if you don't maintain basic systems. A lot of our infrastructure is seriously over capacity. We can't afford to fix this. Our road systems are routinely handling far more traffic than they were designed for. In the West, we found that we simply can't keep up at all. It's financially impossible. Traffic will expand to consume all available capacity. If there's less traffic, people move further out into the suburbs. You need traffic to force people to live closer in, but 
This means that you then have road systems that are fundamentally overburdened, and you get things like bridges falling down when you don't expect it. Uh, even building heavy transit lines is not really affordable. You know, uh, it's taken New York 50 years to build the Second Avenue subway line. They still haven't found funding for most of it because building a new subway line through a first world city is fantastically expensive. So the system runs way over capacity and people just sort of deal until it breaks. There are other even longer term forces which are kind of triggering this whole thing. The money that the West built our infrastructure on, the, uh, the infrastructure that gives us these very nice standards of living that we enjoy out here, was built on the colonial legacy. We have been able to do as much as we have because over the past 500 years, people from the first world, people from the West, went out to the rest of the world, took absolutely everything that was worth having, and shot anyone who got in the way. This gave us a fair bit of money because the rest of the world used to have some nice things that we took. Um, so we've built ourselves this, this unimaginable standard of living and, you know, used this kind of this bolus of wealth, but we've pretended that this gain was actually just income, that that was just how the world worked, that we were actually just that rich instead of that this was this temporary, uh, temporary benefit, you know, that it was, that it was um, income, not theft. It's not, and that money has mostly been spent now. If you haven't noticed, the West is increasingly going bankrupt. Um, entire companies are defaulting on sovereign debt, or countries are defaulting on sovereign debts, you know, partially because they made bad bets, but also simply because the money that used to be sustaining them is now running out. We're facing an environmental deficit. The infrastructure that we built over the past couple of centuries was built in a completely unsustainable manner. Um, this has been both part and parcel of colonialism, but it's been going on for a lot longer in different societies. We can see as part of the historical record, instance after instance of civilizations that didn't realize how heavily they depended on some natural resource, overconsumed that resource, and the civilization just disappeared. Um, you know, there was an entire delightful uh, river valley situation, uh, civilization in India that just vanished when they ran out of water. Um, we have our, our own resources that we're running out of. The infrastructure and the societies that we've built have been designed around a set of assumptions that we're finding out now are no longer going to hold true. Fixing this means that we can't only just patch and repair the existing infrastructure and try to keep up with the capacity, which we already can't do, but we actually have to radically reinvent it, which we can't really conceive of how we do, and really, we'd kind of like to do this in a way that doesn't disrupt these very nice societies that we've built on top of this infrastructure. Um, we, we don't have the, the understanding of the time scale. We don't have the conception of the scope of the problem for how to fix this. Um, we are operating in the, we are trying to do this large scale collective action in the context of a society which favors individual gain over social good, which means it's mostly just not happening. So we've got a bit of a problem here. You can't understand problem, you can't fix a problem that you don't understand. So let's take a look at how things fail. You can fit failure into two fairly easy categories to understand. There are simple failures. Um, simple failures are, are not, not generally a big deal. Like a key structural member in a bridge breaks and the whole thing falls into the river. You know, so a few hundred people die, but unless you're on the bridge, that's not really a big deal. Um, except, of course, when that bridge is also the link between your island and the mainland, and now your shipping networks are cut off, and you're in immediate danger of starving to death. This is a chain failure, and this is where things actually start to become problematic. The hyper-connected nature of modern infrastructure means we see more and more of these chained failures. The banking system is a chained failure. You know, there were a few things that blew up that took down things that should have been completely independent, things that people had sworn up and down couldn't possibly be affected. Oops. Chain failures incur, um, occur inside single infrastructural systems as well as between them. Um, Large-scale uh, electrical blackouts are another obvious chain failure where you have a single power substation that blows, load shifts around, the next power substation gets overloaded, that blows, and then all of a sudden the entire western or eastern seaboard of the United States is you know, off the grid. Connectivity in an infrastructural network is a form of optimization. A system which is highly efficient under normal conditions is often tightly coupled. 
In the electrical grid, connectivity allows utilities to sell power between generation markets. It allows them to centralize generation, and it allows them to compete on price. It gives a lot of the economies of scale that we've used to build the first world infrastructure to the degree that we have. Spare capacity or resources sitting around a system waiting to be deployed represent inefficiency. They also represent lead time to fix the system when a link breaks and the ability to recover from single point failures. A network which has a lot of lead time built into it isn't necessarily more robust against any single given point failure. It can be just as fragile in any given point, but the, you know, and the system will still fail in the same way in the end once you've exhausted all of those resources, but by reducing efficiency, you give yourself a practical protection against that kind of infrastructural fragility. However, it's expensive, and we all know what companies like to do. As the complexity of our society has increased, so have the complexity of our infrastructure and the length of our supply chains. The US Department of Defense provides a lot of really great examples here. The DOD pays 50 cents a US gallon for diesel fuel. This is ridiculously cheap. It costs $400 a gallon to deliver that diesel fuel to an M1 Abrams tank in Afghanistan. The cost per unit of the infrastructure exceeds the cost of the basic commodity by a factor of 800. This is what long supply chains can do to you. You end up spending far more in the way of resources to make this big networked infrastructure work because you have all of these great capabilities, because you have all the flexibility that you've gotten from this from these modern infrastructure. Half of all DOD personnel and a third of their budget are spent on logistics. 70% of the tonnage they move during a deployment is fuel. Modern infrastructural systems have, thanks to the coercive efficiency demands of capital, become really heavily optimized. They're also very fragile because of this. Um, when failures happen on a much longer timeline than efficiency gains, centralized, efficient, cheap, and brittle systems look like a great deal. You know, when you're only looking at the quarterly report and you don't see that every 10-year failure, it looks awesome. In our banking systems, we've gone a step worse. We've magnified the negative effects of failure via leverage to provide marginally more short-term short -term gain. In exchange for a decade or two of year-on-year 12% -year gains, we've racked up enough exposure to failure such that when the crash finally hit, it wiped out all profits from the entire history of the banking industry. Chain failures tend to have an accelerating effect. A single hit trigger hits, possibly randomly, and then the system attempts to adapt. It burns through whatever stored resources it has. When the accumulated stress triggers the next failure, most of the system's resources have already been expended trying to fix the first failure, making the second failure move that much more quickly. Now the resources are gone. There's no buffer. The system fails immediately over the, to the third system. And then you get this chain that the further down the chain you go, the faster the, uh, the, faster the brakes accelerate, which is why you can end up sitting around one morning having your coffee, and then the next thing you know, it's complete chaos. Understanding how a system will fail is hard because we're not always aware where the dependency are, dependencies are. So let's look at this from a really immediate perspective. You're sitting here right now in this room. In the event of a serious structural failure, like, say, the imminent and immediate collapse of the euro, there are about six ways that you can die. If you get too, whole, too cold, too hot, too hungry, too thirsty, too sick, or too injured, you die. You cannot fix any of these conditions or any of the things that lead to these conditions on your own as an individual. Under the status quo, the systems that can fix any of these things succeed or failure, fail at a much larger scale than any individual. We can divide the world into about four levels of scale. The individual, the group, which is anything sort of between a family and a village, the organization, a large company or region, and the nation state. Let's take a look at just hunger. In order to eat, you need food. To get food, unless you're a self-sufficient farmer, you need a working system of exchange, which in the West means a functioning currency market, which operates at the state level. If you've got that, you need to get food from the farmer to you. This requires a road or a rail network, which requires fuel, which requires fuel markets and refineries. If you are a self-sufficient farmer, you need the rule of law. You need sufficient guarantee so that you can have land security so that you can actually grow that food and know that harvest to harvest, you'll be able to actually get something back from your labor. 
This puts you back up to at least the large organization level. This set of concepts, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to go through all the detail on that map right now. I'll give you uh, pointers to resources at the end. It's called the Simple Critical Infrastructure Map. It tries to figure out what an actor needs at each level to survive in the short term. Groups and organizations and nation states all have their own immediate needs, although the time scales tend to be a bit longer, um, that, those, that those organizations need to stay alive. None of these are sufficient in the long term, but this, this is basically an effective triage to buy time. Most of the work that we do in our day-to-day -day lives isn't aimed at basic survival, but if we try to analyze the entire package of modern society at once, we get mired in all the complexity of the modern world. With simple infrastructure maps, we get a, we get a roadmap for taking care of what the immediate needs are, what the things that we have to solve right now to stay alive. There's a lot more here, um, especially once you start looking at all the interconnections between the levels and where the cycles are and that kind of thing. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, have, uh, I'll have pointers to resources at the end, and you can come talk to me afterwards. Every one of these requirements that's identified by SIM needs a strategy that ensures resilience if you want to have long-term survivability. The closer you get to the individual, the more immediate those needs are and the more immediate that resilience strategy needs to be. The smaller the scale that an, individual, that an individual's needs can be met at, um, the more the individual can do work directly to get those needs satisfied, and the more, in a disaster, they can actually help themselves instead of waiting for the nation state to get back on its feet, become a functioning entity again, and hopefully get them food before they've died of starvation. What matters now is that we understand that there are specific critical paths where you need to maintain resilience. So now that we understand where these kind of existential vulnerabilities are, we need to understand what the failure points are in the provision routes for those needs, um, what the failure points are in the systems that can keep us alive. Ideally, we'd like a tool that gives us actionable information about mediations for those failure points, or at least lets us compare different solutions for the same kinds of need. Conveniently, there's an analysis tool that lets us do exactly that um, from right here in the computer security world. Threat modeling at the most general level is a methodology that lets you understand how a system can fail. It lets us model the different intentions of multiple actors, what constitutes a failure of the system for each of them, and how they'd like the system to respond to those failures. Again, I don't have time to get into all the details here, but I'm going to run through a high-level schematic of how a threat model works. Constructing a threat model is basically a four-step process. First, and this is an example from the software world because it's fairly simple and easy to get your head around, we identify all of the actors in the system, you know, people and autonomous processes that use the system and make it work. Next, we define the set of assets in the system, all of the nouns that are present. Um, assets are concrete things we care about, like a bag of flour or a transaction on a bank account. Then we define what actions each actor is supposed to be able to perform on each asset and under what conditions. This defines what we call the business rules of the system, which is kind of the core of what a system is and does. You know, for instance, you say, okay, this actor can perform this action you know, between the hours of nine to five, subject to the approval of a supervisor. You know, banking systems and that kind of thing have a lot of these rules that are, that are factored very explicitly, but you can do the same thing for physical systems. Next, we take a look at each component of the action matrix that we saw on the previous slide and come up with the set of things that aren't supposed to happen in the system. Um, there, are, there are two related sets here. There's a set of denial of service attacks, which are some actor preventing some legitimate actor from doing something. And then there's a set of elevation of privilege attacks, all of the things that we don't want somebody to be able to do, like steal that bag of flour that you were planning on eating. Together, these are the set of all potential threats to the system, all of the things that can violate the basic agreed upon function. In any real system, it turns out to be the case that a lot of the potential threats we simply don't care about. They either don't make that much sense or they're, they don't actually really matter. There's a subset, however, that at least one actor in the system cares a whole lot about. So um, each actor has a set of security objectives, which is the set of threats that they care about, the conditions that those threats can come into effect on the configuration of the system that those threats can be realized in, and what they'd like the system to do in that state, you know, how they'd like the system to respond. Um, you know, do we want to just detect the system and notify on it so that we can fix it later? Do we really need the system to stop this, um, et cetera? You know, can we just ignore this? 
Security objectives are really vital. They tell us what we need to guarantee in order to maintain system security and integrity. So this is the process by which you ensure that some warlord doesn't steal off the, all the food off of that aid truck. Um, whereas they may have a completely different set of objectives. In adversarial systems, which many resource distribution networks are, which is about half of the systems that we care about, the security objectives of different actors in the system can be in direct conflict. Sometimes these conflicting objectives can be resolved by changing the system so it can operate more harmoniously. In a lot of other cases, though, in most other cases, all parties to the system just have to agree on a subset of the objectives or seek out some kind of social solution. This isn't a method which will solve the social problems. It just points out the social problems and the implementation problems so that you can figure out how to make the system respond better to failures. In either case, having this kind of formal understanding of the business rules and the security objectives of a system enable you to actually have that conversation. Once we've got an idea of what our security objectives are, we can model the data flow through the system or the you know, general flows through the system. In a computer system, we look at data stores and processes and interconnects. In physical systems, we can construct uh, similar diagrams, but in physical space, moving real objects around. For each action, we then build out a use case that describes each step of how that action is implemented. You know, each step of how process gets transmitted, um, each step of where the food goes, who signs for it, that kind of thing. Taken together, a use case describes all of the aspects of the actual functioning of the system at the level which is relevant for our analysis. Fourth and finally, we can use this process called HAZOP, which is this awesome thing that came out of the chemical engineering world where they've done a certain amount of work on resilient infrastructures, even if it doesn't always work. Um, this, is, this is short for hazards of operations. Um, it's a structured vocabulary that's designed to let you take a look at the way a use case is described, the way a system is supposed to function, and figure out for each step all of the things that might go wrong, what the possible consequences of those failures might be. So we cross-reference each possible failure with the security objectives of the different actors and ensure that the system has then implemented those security objectives. Um, the same thing could be said for reliability objectives, you know, all sorts of different kinds of issues where you need to guarantee that the system is going to function appropriately. We can look for cases at this point, now that we understand how the system can fail, where failures chain and where we can get those um, connected uh, chained failures, which is what makes these individual single point failures really dangerous. Once we've detected places where a single point of failure can cause cascading problems, we then have this roadmap where we can change the system, where we can redesign the system, where we can evaluate alternatives and say, okay, does this system give us what we need? You can adapt this to a pretty wide variety of situations and systems. Um, in addition to the sort of more traditional software systems I work with on professionally, I'm currently doing work towards threat models for things as diverse as the new Icelandic National Constitution and the uh, combined human and software processes for emergency information sharing um, in the Ushahidi system, where you've got things mixing in between the physical world and the electronic world. So threat modeling alone isn't the solution to infrastructural analysis. There's a lot of existing tools that come out of the various engineering disciplines that build all of these systems. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different analysis tools for electrical grids and that kind of thing, but they tend to only think inside their system, so we need tools that can bridge the gaps between systems, bridge the gaps between infrastructures, and understand how societies fail across infrastructural networks, um, how infrastructures cause each other to fail, um, and a lot of those systems are aimed at things like resources or, you know, um, you know, efficiency, that kind of thing. They don't necessarily give you this sort of understanding of where the power structures are in these systems. So when you look at the world from this perspective of system failure, it's kind of hard to understand sometimes why we don't have resilient infrastructure already. Many of the reasons are pretty obvious once we've, once we've discussed. You have over-optimization, failure to understand chain failures, that kind of thing. But one of the things that's really kept us tied to these um, very top-down, centralized, fragile systems is basically that the structure of, infra of our infrastructure mirrors the socioeconomic power structures that we've built, it, you know, that we've used to build it. Infrastructure 
can be seen as a tool of social enforcement. If there's one power company, everybody has to pay their power bill. It you know, gives you this sort of centralizing function. Decentralized infrastructure means that it's a lot harder to use infrastructure as a tool of social enforcement. When systems fail, resilience doesn't just give us technical options and a better chance at immediate survival, it gives us social options other than simply paying more and more obeisance to the powers that be in hopes that they'll turn the lights back on and give us food. Resilience makes us equal partners in what happens, um, good and bad. Fragile systems make us starving peasants. So we've seen a never-ending stream of large-scale natural and unnatural disasters, situations where existing infrastructure has been destroyed or disrupted and people have been forced to migrate. Um, where new systems for survival have needed to be put in at a large scale, whether it's famine or war or earthquakes or tsunamis. We've been doing large scale humanitarian work as a society for well over 50 years and we're still shockingly bad at it. We show up, we dump resources into the situation, most of which are immediately captured by warlords or other bad actors. We leave a population which is dependent on foreign aid, at least as dependent as it was when we first showed up, if not more so and no knowledge or technology transfer occurs to the served population. I'm not claiming to have the specific answers here, but the bar is pretty low. By most measures, the humanitarian project is largely a failure when it comes to enabling actual long-term survival beyond the scope of immediate aid. It does keep people alive, but in a lot of cases, it's actually a pretty open question as to whether or not, especially in the case of things like humanitarian aid and war zones, it's actually even a net positive for human life. Different systems and different solutions are needed with an emphasis on skill transfer. Um, systems that break down, the, uh, break down the fundamental units of resilience into things that people can actually learn, into things that allow people to actually affect change on their own, and that allow people to use resources that are given to take care of, take care of themselves and actually build you know, long-term change so that they're not just living from aid donation to aid donation. So right now, when you get a, a large scale disaster, one of the first things that tends to happen is all of your existing social structures break down. That map that I showed you before with those intermediate steps between the nation state and the individual, when you don't have any social structures left, the nation state has to fix everything because there's nothing else left. Um, one of the things which is really important when you look at possible solutions is solutions that allow people to act inside the existing social groups they already have and preserve those kinds of social structures. So obviously um, technical solutions to social problems are kind of to be taken to a grain of salt, but you can start from technical solutions sometimes. Um, for instance, right now, the standard housing unit, which is deployed by the UN and the International Red Cross, is a tarp-based tent, which is normally set out in a way which doesn't really allow people to maintain existing social networks. It doesn't allow people any gathering. It doesn't allow people to maintain social units or social cohesiveness. Um, it also costs 350 US plus 100 in shipping, doesn't stand up to moderate wind loads, needs replacing after a year, and provides little or no protection against cold weather. In any country that builds with poor in place concrete, which is the majority of the world, there are stocks of plywood or oriented strand board and an infrastructure for moving them. For the cost of shipping a tent, you can build with minimal tools a 15 square meter structure called a hexiert that'll stand up to a 120 uh, kilometer an hour wind load. Uh, for a little bit more money and supplies available, you can build it out of foam and have something that provides real insulation or insulation. Um, with tape and paint, it can last multiple years and it's still light enough that it can be easily carried and moved so you don't have to worry about the problems of um, refugee camps becoming permanent. These structures tile and they can be arranged in ways that the traditional tents can't, which means that you can actually have family structures, which means you can maintain village cohesiveness to the extent that those people are still able to travel together to that kind of thing. You know, there are, it gives you other options for how you set things up. Um, there are uh, other similar structures that you can build so you can actually have large community spaces that you can deploy easily without a lot of infrastructure. Um, one of the uh, 
the most fascinating projects that I've seen that came out of the uh, sort of architecture for um, architecture for camps world was a really simple thing where it was just let's let's build a really big tent so that all of these camps that are being built in Muslim areas can have mosques and can have the basic units of their civilization and their social structure back. Um, this is another way to do the same thing that gives you much, much better options than building something where you're still just sort of in this flimsy tent structure and you can't really actually have a life in the meantime. The Hexier was designed as part of, the of a plan for the evacuation of cities in the US in the event of nuclear war. Existing Department of Defense plans would have resulted in about 75% die-offs in the case of a permanent total urban evacuation, mostly within the first two years. With a bit of luck and careful planning and some of these kinds of technological enablers, you could get this down to as little as like maybe 25% die-off, which is, you know, a pretty, good, uh, a pretty good step in the right direction. So, better yet, in disaster situations, um, instead of shipping aid, ship knowledge. Um, I mean, you may need to ship actual physical resources, too, if the resources don't exist on the ground anymore. But when you can ship knowledge-based solutions, you can enable people. Instead of saying, okay, once the, once the specific packaged aid is gone, you know, you're, you're back to where you were, you can, you can actually help people um, help themselves. So, for instance, um, in Haiti right now, there's been a huge cholera outbreak. Cholera can be reasonably filtered through a half dozen layers of cloth. It's not perfect, you still get some cases, but you manage to get rid of the bulk of the cases so you can hopefully stem the epidemic spread, which means that you're then not running out of hospital beds, you can actually treat the cases that you still get. And, you know, this is, it's just a, a situation of needing to spread this kind of knowledge. Um, likewise, instead of shipping tons and tons of water, to locations which have, you know, perfectly reasonable existing but contaminated water supplies, ship, you know, a few thousand pounds of bleach, of powdered bleach, and teach people how to use that to make their water safe. It's a lot cheaper, it's a lot easier, and you actually have enabled some people to do something that they can then use going forward. Um, in comparison to some of the other stuff I've, I've been talking about, this seems kind of frivolous, but the Burning Man experience and similar events can actually be really useful as a proving ground for developing these kinds of technologies. Um, I mean, you can do it in concert in the field, but it's a lot harder to do R&D work in the field where you don't have backups and things can't fail. Um, and it's also, these kinds of events can be a great way to get mindshare out about these kinds of things. There's a lot of crossover between the, uh, the sort of festival circuit and the NGO world, you know, at the volunteers on the ground level. Um, the Hexiard has started to take over in what you can sort of see as a middle-class refugee camp. Um, you know, it's a temporary city that you build out of nothing that holds about 50,000 people, which is about the size of a big UN refugee camp, um, and you have to bring all the infrastructure with you. So a tool that works there ought to work in other refugee camps. Um, there's also a lot of projects like Burners Without Borders and that kind of thing where there's actually starting to be some, some real direct crossover. Um, if we're going to be able to carry out and build the kind of resilient infrastructures that we'd like to see, we need places to practice these. So we'd really like to not get to that situation. Disasters are going to happen. You're going to have natural disasters. We're going to have more natural disasters. But cascading failures don't need to turn into disasters. Um, we've got other problems that are, that are kind of pushing things in this direction, too. All of these cash-strapped governments would really love to push the cost of infrastructure provision directly back to the people. The big society moves that the Tories have been doing in the UK are basically marketing spin for, we're just going to stop doing whatever it is we're, we were doing right now. If you'd like to keep having these services, we suggest you figure out a way to provide them for yourselves. This kind of sucks, but on the other hand, that means they've also stepped out of having a say on how those services are provided. So we don't necessarily have a choice to say no about the provision of services in a resilient and sort of crowdsourced manner. But if we're lucky, maybe we can start figuring out other ways to do things before all of the old versions go away entirely. Since it's up to us to figure out how they work, we don't have to and almost certainly can't afford to go with the old top-down power structures. 
So the maker culture and the maker movement is actually really a shining hope here. Right now, a lot of what we're building are basically toys and gadgets. Um, they're really cool toys, but they're not actually that useful. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing the movement starting to grow up a bit and starting to take on more serious problems. You know, we've got the tools, we've got the network, we have the understanding of how to build things. We have this, you know, increasingly, uh, increasingly large skill base. Um, why don't we start solving real problems for, uh, for real situations? Why don't we start working on building real infrastructure that we can deploy to the field to solve the problems that we need to keep us alive? One of the other reasons why I'm really interested in seeing the maker movement kind of stepping in and providing some of these solutions is the maker movement tends to think about intellectual property in the right way. Um, intellectual property for the design of tools for resilience is socioeconomic power structure destiny. One way or another, we're going to end up with resilient infrastructure because non-resilient infrastructures are going to cease to be functional. However, companies can build resilient infrastructure once they realize that they have sufficient impetus that they have to. If companies and um, you know, uh, corporate organizations build, the, build that infrastructure, they're going to build it under the same IP rules that we've seen them building everything else under. So if we like to have the freedom to actually, you know, mess with our infrastructure, to change it, to fix it, to make it work better, to get out of these power structures that we're seeing ourselves locked into, then we need open, resilient infrastructure. Um, you know, IP could be the tool that'll force us with a top-down hierarchy with bottom-up infrastructure, but maybe we can get um, open hardware infrastructure. You know, maybe we can build the new power generation network that we're going to need once grids start becoming more and more unstable because all of the coal-based power plants aren't really working so well anymore and don't really have the supplies that they need. Maybe what we build next time can actually be something that we can modify and that we can share. The existing green movement has done you know, a lot of really good work, but it's also really bad at engaging with the powers that be. The maker movement maybe may not be so bad. You know, a lot of people in the maker community do work at big corporations, understand how some of these power structures work. Um, it doesn't have to continue being the same way where, you know, big corporations and the state are always the enemy of any kind of progressive work. And I understand that in Europe, you guys have things a little bit better than we do in the US, but you know, the, the issue is still there. Very few people in the green movement um, want to have anything to do with entities like, the, like Walmart and the US Department of Defense. And yet, these organizations have more of an effect on the environment than anything that any one individual, any group of individuals could possibly hope to do. Walmart decided um, four months ago that they were going to start tracking sustainability for every product that they sell, and they were going to start pushing organic food into every location. This single decision by one corporate agency, one corporate entity, will have more of an effect on the global industrial food network than the entire past 40 years of the green movement. Um, if you can't work with agencies like that, you can't get the kind of large-scale change that is needed to make new resilient systems actually take off into a place. So the DOD accounts for 2% of all US fossil fuel consumption. They also have a larger resource and development budget than any other single entity in the world. And when they deploy a piece of technology, it immediately hits the kinds of numbers that you need for cheap scalability and industrial production. The DOD has decided that by 2020, 50% of all aircraft fuel will come from non-fossil uh, fuel sources. Um, and 50% you know, of, all, of all DOD aircraft fuel, fuel, which is their single largest share of fuel use. Um, the, the best candidate there looks, right now looks to be, uh, be algae-derived fuel. Um, by 2040, they intend to use no fossil fuel. Uh, we'll see if there's fossil fuel left for them to not use then. But uh, this is great. It means that whether or not we can continue justifying the, the carbon emissions in the future, this single act, this single choice, which they've realized, oh, we have to do this. I mean, you know, they were forced into it. But this single choice on their part means that it's, very, it's much, much more likely that civilians will be able to keep flying. Um, if there wasn't this kind of large-scale development of 
uh, non-fossil derived Jet A, we'd all get stuck on the ground. Um, I like traveling, I'd like to keep traveling, so that's great. Um, maybe we should work with people like this who can have this kind of scale and have this kind of reach and as we build these technologies, not assume that they are always going to be the bad guys. Um, also, they've done a whole lot of research into things like supply chains, into how they fail, how they don't fail, and how they can scale. You know, the DoD doesn't like the fact that it costs them $400 to ship a gallon of, of diesel fuel. They'd really like that to be cheaper. Um, maybe we could help figure out how to make it cheaper for them and cheaper for us. Um, this has some implications that we may or may not like, but at a certain point, if you want the tools to solve the real-world problems that we face, we have to go to the people who have the tools right now. So uh, let's get to work while we still have time. Great, so if you have questions, raise your hand and we'll come around with the mic to uh, let you uh, speak into it so everyone can hear and on the recording as well. And uh, yeah, we'll get started. Uh, and we'll, we'll start with a couple of questions from the outside world on IRC. Hello, okay. Uh, one question from IRC is, um, yeah, don't you think that people can actually manage to survive after a big system failure and by growing crops and, and, and by themselves and things like that. Uh, apparently like they did in world, after World War II in Germany. I'm not sure that's actually true, but that's what I, is asked. So um, yes, people can, but there's not a lot of room to grow wheat in the middle of large cities. And that's where the people are, and you have to move the wheat from the, fill, you know, from the fields in the countryside where there's room to where the people are. Right now we import, you know, we as the West import a whole lot of food from a whole lot of other places. We have much less of the infrastructure that was still around in World War II and the knowledge to um, actually grow food ourselves, to grow food on non-industrial scales. Um, we could get back there, we may have to get back there. In fact, the uh, the DOD nuclear evacuation plan was um, assuming that we would get back there in this very immediate and brutal manner, but if you mess up that bootstrapping process, everyone dies. Um, it's not easy to get back to growing your own food. Thank you. Uh, another question is... Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, as long as international aid organizations aren't giving knowledge, uh, they are making money. And aid of these organizations are earning huge amount of money. Uh, how can we make them change behavior, if that makes sense? Um, I'm not really sure. You know, I, I don't know what the answer is as far as, um, you know, I mean, I, I don't really have a good answer for that one. I mean, you know, that's that's... We're going to need larger social change to deal with the, the problems of you know, people in, in the aid world taking a lot of money. I don't think that's the biggest problem. You know, um, somebody who's running an NGO taking down a million euro a year salary is not what is keeping the food aid from getting to the villages or stopping the food aid from you know, providing a long-term sustainable uh, solution. You've deployed an interesting and impressive array of uh, precise analyses uh, for natural disasters, but your audience is uh, uh, here mainly geeks who deal in particular with artificial systems. We have an ongoing example of a disaster in an artificial world, namely the banking and finance disaster. Do you have any uh, advice to people who might be interested in doing something to prevent further decay in that system or, or disastrous in those systems? I mean, so as far as what you could do if you are in a position of having the authority to change that system, you know, I mean, 
you need to build a system where you do not you are not hurt by failure out of all proportion to success you know where if if one small failure means you lose the entire business and one small success you know one you know one su large success means you gain a little bit of money you have a kind of an imbalance and your event you know your system is eventually going to fail because you eventually will have that small failure um as far as getting into a position to actually afford that, you know, or actually affect that change, I don't know, run for office, you know, found a bank, do a better job, don't go out of business. Um, I mean, that's a, a lot of these systems are large scale coordination problems. Um, the reason why I'm talking about this here is there are a lot of geeks of a lot of colors here. There are a lot of people who design all sorts of systems. And increasingly, there is an electronic component to most infrastructure and to most distribution systems. Those components need to be resilient too, and people need to be aware of those problems. I have uh, two questions for you, a quick one and a longer one. The first one is you said that this subway being built in New York City was incredibly expensive. Just what is that number? Uh, sorry, what? I... That um, subway that's getting built in New York City, just how expensive is that? I don't have the number off the top of my head. I want to say it's on the order of 50 billion for five miles, maybe? Okay. A I little bit a, of money. I have a longer question then. This technology that the DOD is developing, how is that going to filter down to private citizens? So, specifically in the case of the, uh, the jet fuel, um, they're doing the basic research and doing the industrial scaling for figuring out how to make jet fuel out of algae or how to make jet fuel from, from, bio, from bio sources. Um, once they've proven the technology, normally, at least in the US, the way it happens is they do a bunch of research, generally in cooperation with corporate partners. That stuff gets put out to, uh, to market, those uh, to bid, if it's an existing technology or simply the partner, the corporate partner who developed it builds it for the DOD, but then also sells it to the general population, you know, sells it to, in this case, it would probably be the airlines or to companies that will operate on behalf of the airlines. Um, first of all, I love to talk. Um, yeah, you're going to hold it in front of some of our politicians, perhaps. That would be um, really useful. And it's something they don't seem to... Um, yeah. Um, no. Um, there are political movements which are sort of starting at the edges where people are starting to get this. Um, the transition towns movement is one of the places where people are sort of realizing on the very small local scale that they need to do what they can. Um, the military is actually one of the best places because they actually do have people thinking on these kinds of time scales. They have people who are aware of resilience and that kind of thing. Um, Food security is in many cases being handled through the military or state departments, um, that kind of thing. You know, it's, it's not necessarily the people who you would like to be working with, but they are the people who are actually having these conversations and thinking about this, so maybe it's the place to start. Okay, second question. How come we haven't seen every clever terrorist yet that um, attack some infrastructure that's vulnerable and not well guarded like um, the power grid? Why we haven't seen terrorist attacks there? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, and generally it's um, yeah, sort of fun to think, um, yeah, I'm a terrorist, um, I want to attack this country, how would I do with this um, in the most efficient way? I would assume because the, uh, so they're not necessarily thinking about the most efficient way, they're, but the efficiency for them is defined in terms of um, social impact, not in terms of necessarily direct economic impact. There's a difference between running a guerrilla war, trying to disable the economy of, company, of a country, um, and running a social war, trying to get them to change policy. Um, when you have guerrillas uh, you know, generating uh, stations, that kind of thing, do get attacked a lot. Um, but because we're dealing with social change, that's probably, I would assume, it hasn't been the best target. Maybe that hasn't occurred to them. I don't know. Also, when you when you look at girls, they do have some sort of cent, uh, decentralized infrastructure because they have somebody constantly fighting them. Sorry, uh, could you repeat the question? Um, I just wanted to remark it. Okay. Hey. Uh, hey. Thank you for uh, your talk. I'm here. <laughs> um, 
you made a few very interesting points, but uh, for me it seems like, uh, well, one thing didn't really get clear to me, because uh, this might sound a bit odd, but why should people care what happens in 50 years? Why should people, single people here, care about something like that? I think there is uh, actually very many people out there that would uh, agree uh, that with you say, well, of course, we want to still be able to keep up this infrastructure in 50 years. But the problem with ca catastrophes is that uh, you usually don't think that they can happen to you. So uh, you don't think uh, about them so much. What is more important to you is your lifestyle, is that the fact that, I don't know, for instance, we, that we can eat meat every single day, although this is unsustainable, uh, basically. And, uh, well, I wonder how we can enable th people to think uh, more about the future, how we can maybe make people care more. I mean, if they, they there's many people out here, uh, out today that don't even want to have children, so why should they care what happens after their death? Well, this might be their I death. I have kids. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, talking about the problem, getting people to be aware of how fragile the systems they depend on is kind of the one of the big places to start. Um, I think as we see more large-scale failures, um, hopefully people will start to realize that this can happen to them. Um, I think that as we deal with having to shift off of fossil fuels, that's probably going to be one of the big triggers because then it's like, oh, I have to change my lifestyle in this actually fairly radical way and I'm hearing this as it's in the news and it becomes much more apparent, maybe that will kind of help people wake up. Um, on the other hand, there's also kind of, it's kind of likely that, yeah, maybe enough people aren't going to wake up. But on the other hand, so maybe people don't wake up, but we have these tested solutions, we have tools that can enable them, so that when they realize, oh, gee, I'm staring out at the wreckage of my civilization, someone can sort of hand them a nice manual for here's how you might get to live for another 10 years. Um, what data is there to support your say, implicit proposition that the cost of doing the infrastructure right is actually smaller than the cost incurred by the expected failures. Uh, what do I have to support that, or what did? Yeah, so you you said it, you know, big catastrophes are ahead, and we should throw more resources at infrastructure. But well, is there any data to support the proposition that the resources we throw at the infrastructure are actually less resources than we need to spend to well avoid all the damages from the catastrophes? Um, I don't have numbers in front of me right now. Um, I, can, I can dig some up and get back to you. But, for instance, I think the, uh, the, the last big eastern seaboard blackout in the U.S. had damages at least in the hundreds of millions of economic loss because it basically shut down society for, uh, you know, shut, shut down any business in that area for quite a while. Um, that's not necessarily the scale of, of doing kind of basic infrastructural maintenance. Um, on the other hand, it's not necessarily, you know, there, there's sort of a double-edged sword that yes, the cost may be huge to when it fails, but we still can't necessarily pay the maintenance cost or pay the maintenance catch-up at this point either, you know, especially if you look at a case like Ireland where they're just sort of out of money. Um, first of, um, first of, I want to say that, um, to the one who asked about the terrorist attacks, there was um, there's maybe something to look in the history of German terrorism for you, because in the beginning there was a discussion about Gewalt gegen Sachen and Gewalt gegen Menschen, uh, violence against things and violence against people. I think, well, it would be interesting to look at this to get a question because. Um, why there are no, not so many attacks on the infrastructure as he's going to think. Um, second off, um, at least in the USA you have got a um, certain subculture who is going, that is going to, in this way called survivalism. Um, do you have any uh, data about how good this one is going to work? Because in the last, I had another discussion about resilience and this thing came up and there was a 
problem that most of the propositions from this kind of angle seem to be very much centralized. You need cars and things like this to have it working. So it would be interesting to know if there have been any research into how um, good this is going to work. Third off, um, well, at least concerning multiplicator effects, uh, first time I looked about resilience and things like this was in um, the case of science fiction because uh, I don't know if anybody is aware of um, the author S.M. Sterling. He's got a um, new series called Dice the Fire where most of the modern infra infrastructure breaks down for reasons that wouldn't work, but well, you can think about it. So maybe um, using this as a trope in literature is interesting to multiplicate or to discuss the effects. And first off, um, have you pondered about the fact of an all-scale zombie effect on resilience? <laughs> Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm not sure if I'll be able to remember all your questions. Uh, science fiction, I think, is, is a very useful tool for understanding the possibility of large social change. Um, you know, to, to address the, the point about, you know, how can we make people understand that they have to, have to deal with this, I think that's, that's something which is, you know, a really useful method for people, for getting people to realize that, oh yes, the world can actually change, is to hear stories of, you know, worlds actually changing, um, you know, letting them, letting them sort of imagine that, oh yes, it can actually, can actually shift like that. Um, on the other hand, I think you also need fiction of the possible alternatives, fiction of the hope that says, okay, yes, you know, there are things that you can do, there are ways that you can patch a system back together, you know, there are ways that you can make things fail less badly and you can still have a life. It's not just, you know, sort of the end TM. You know, you, the, the world ends and then you still have to wake up the next day and figure out what you're going to do. Um, I, uh, I think I lost another question or, or two in there. Um, about, uh, yeah, about survivalists. In the US, one of the problems with the survivalist culture is it tends to be very isolationist, where people are like, I am going to have my compound in the woods and I will you know, shoot anyone who crosses my land. And that's not the way rural societies work. You have to work with your neighbors. <laughs> you must be resilient. Much of what resilience is, is people. Um, so I think that's... That's the big problem I would see there. I mean, a lot of that is also just pretty divorced. You know, it's like the uh, uh, Glenn Beck, the, the US um, uh, conservative, whatever you want to call him, was, uh, was selling this like survival food kit. It was a year of canned food. Great. What do you do the next year? Oh. I've got uh, one observation and a question. Um, the observation was about the uh, uh, good, good numbers about maintenance versus uh, management of uh, catastrophe. Uh, uh, aviation safety engineering for the last 60 years is, has fantastic business cases around all of this. And deep sea oil drilling uh, as well. Uh, recently, I think people yeah. in the Gulf of Mexico have a bit of experience with that. My, my question was, um, it, and it came up from uh, what was dis described as discussion, it seems to me that maybe we don't always talk about the right kinds of things related to co design and maintenance of complex systems when we're talking about public policy or inside businesses. And m my observation, I guess, is that we don't always have a good language to describe things and we have a great difficulty in categorizing problems and the sorts of problems. Do you think there's a case for something like anti-patterns? Quite likely. Um, to some degree, that's what threat modeling attempts to do. As it's, it's much more in detail than that. It's not describing just like kind of general um, patterns of failure, but it's saying, OK, let's look at, let's have a way to actually talk about the way a system can fail. Um, you know, it's something we see in the security world all the time where we don't understand like, oh, great, it's a buffer overflow. Well, what does that mean in the context of the system as an actual like business process? Um, and I think we, we run into the same thing where we don't necessarily understand, you know, and, and hopefully that's one tool that can, that can kind of lead in that direction. Um, I think we do need a lot more language there though. 
Oh, uh, Ella, could I just no, for a quick second? Um, normally, we're we're supposed to cut off with the streams. We've actually had a lot of people in the peace missions who wanted this to continue. Should we give her another 15 minutes? Is it good? You want that? Okay, cool. It's done. Okay, is it on? Okay, um, my question would, yeah. <laughs> uh, what is this maker movement you mentioned? Sorry, can you repeat it? What is this maker movement you mentioned? Uh, the maker? Make it, oh, so it may be more visible as a thing in sort of US geek circles, but it's kind of Make Magazine and MakerBots and all of these people soldering together kits and designing electronics and maybe starting to actually build some physical things that aren't electronic. Um, it seems to be sort of catalyzing as a bit of a, so, as a, bit of a social movement um, of, you know, of kind of communities. You know, the hacker spaces in the US tend to be um, a lot of the time, somewhat heavily centered around physically making objects. Um, you know, I don't know if it's something that will end up having real staying power, but it seems like it might be really good if it ended up being uh, being a thing. You know, it certainly it seems like the kind of thing which could cause real change and could be a a locus of knowledge and tools and capability to do the kind of development work that we need to build bottom up systems. Thanks. So let me just add to that about the maker movement, that there's been a very long tradition of people making things in craft, uh, using various forms of craft, as in your grandmother probably knitted and your mother probably sews and all of that stuff. But the maker movement is embracing the idea of bringing uh, technology and advancing the bounds of technology into, uh, into construction that's done by individuals rather than by industry. And a lot of that stuff is what has potential to survive in the event of various flavors of apocalypse. Okay. Can, um, in the whole talk, um, or now, I'm missing one dimension, like the time scale. So I think it's, you, you mentioned that it's really, it costs really much money to create gas to Iraq or any other place in the world, but isn't it the cost, uh, cost for uh, so cost so much money because they can deploy it in maybe 84 hours and the f fuel you buy in your um, gas station is um, stays there for a long time, comes with a tank or tr through pipelines, and the same thing goes with uh, the knowledge you say as uh, some magic. A thing you can put uh, on the place and they can help themselves, but the, this takes a lot of time and to grow wheat it actually takes maybe six months or five months and the light, the tents are maybe faster to um, build up and you can build a, a normal or old tent in maybe half an hour or so. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the time factor is a lot of why it costs the DoD as much as it does. Um, more, uh, more to the point, though, is assurance that they need to know that they will have the quantity of fuel they need in the, in the spot they need it when they need it. So it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, they can't in Afghanistan just go, you know, drive the tank down to the local gas station and use the fuel that's already there. Um, you know, they need their fuel convoys. and. A lot of that ends up being that uh, a lot of the, the cost there ends up being like protecting that fuel in transit and that kind of thing. Um, I think like a third or a quarter of casualties were related to convoys. Um, so yeah, I mean, there is a time factor to a lot of this stuff. There's a time factor to when oil will run out. There's a time factor to how long you have to um, provision food. There's a time factor, you know, after a disaster. Um, you know, and it does take a while to transmit knowledge, but there are also issues of fundamental strategy where right now, yes, okay, so great, NGOs may need to just drop ship, you know, 100 tons of water for the first 72 hours, but that doesn't mean that they need to keep shipping in bottles of water six months after a disaster when they've had the time to do the education work and give people alternate resources.
Um, because you were um, talking about threat modeling, did anybody um, build this in software, perhaps even publicly available, uh, openly accessible? To do threat models? Yep. So the uh, octotrike.org there is a threat modeling research project that I've been working on for about seven years. Um, uh, what's out right now is pretty old. Um, we're hopefully going to be doing a new release of the software in April. And uh, I will hopefully, if I have time to write it, have a paper out in maybe February or so, which will explain the current version of the methodology and hopefully some accompanying stuff that will mention um, some of these, these kinds of non-software um, non use cases. Um, one more question from IRC. Um, you said the, the maintenance costs are lower than the, the, the failure costs. Uh, is that always the time, or are there times when failure is economically necessary or helpful? Well, I think if you dig yourself into a big enough infrastructural hole, it may certainly make sense. I mean, so uh, an easy example is occasionally we just blow up bridges instead of rebuilding them. You know, because, you know, the maintenance has got to the point where fixing what we have already is going to be ridiculously expensive. So we'll just get everybody out of the way, force the bridge to fail in a safe fashion, and then just rebuild it from scratch because that's easier. Um, another example is the banking system. Um, you have the cases of Iceland and Ireland, which were both really behind a rock um, with respect to their banking systems being really, really heavily leveraged. Iceland decided, well, we're just going to let this all fail, and it'll kind of suck. But now their economy doesn't actually look that bad. Um, Ireland decided, no, we're going to guarantee 100% we will not let this infrastructure fail. Yeah, it's not looking so hot as a, as a choice.